Um, thank you very much for joining today uh, to our webinar training session part one, Unbound and Subgrade uh, Materials Characterization. And I'm Jayant Kodikara, uh, Director of the Spark Hub in Department of Civil Engineering, Monash University. Let me first uh, give an introduction to our Spark Hub. Uh, it is an ARC, Australian Research Council Research Hub for Smart Next Generation Transport Payments. And it was uh, initiated uh, last year, July. So we are just completing one year. And as you can see here, our mission and mission and uh, ARC scheme uh, is funding this uh, uh, hub is uh, known as Industry Transformation Research Hub Scheme. Uh, so our intention is to transform the Australian payment industry uh, to make it better. Sorry, Jayanta. Uh, just to interrupt, uh, the screen is uh, not uh, shared actually. So if you could uh, select the screen, that would be great. Ah, sorry. Is it better now? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, vision and mission uh, is displayed here. And uh, in our hub, uh, we have uh, 21 plus industry partners led by ARB, Osroads, and CIMIC Group. Uh, we also have eight uh, local universities led by Monash University. And we have seven overseas uh, partners, predominantly universities, uh, 27 uh, uh, chief investigators from those eight universities as academics. Then we have uh, 40 uh, PhD scholars uh, when the hub will be in full operation uh, early next year. Uh, currently, we have 22 uh, research scholars altogether 42 research hub projects. And we are located in uh, 71 November Road, Notting Hill, uh, which is a rented space from CSIRO uh, in Monash University. So we, our hub has uh, five research themes, uh, starting from research theme one, uh, we can see uh, innovative materials, modeling and design, and that is led by myself. Uh, and then theme two, smart sensing, construction and maintenance monitoring. Uh, that's led by Professor Jeff Walker, our head of department. And then we have uh, payment rehabilitation, environment footprint minimization and infrastructure resilience. Team three is led by Professor Sanjayan from Sinban University. And team four is on future transport demand adaptation and safety and is led by Professor Hai Wu in civil engineering at Monash. Then final team, team five, uh, is on integrated asset management and is led by Professor Sujiva in RMIT. So this picture depicts uh, uh, the hub research at a glance. Uh, if you start from the left side of this picture, you can see the smart testing modeling and design uh, where we try to develop new testing methods uh, relevant to payment engineering, uh, starting from triaxials and so on, uh, and design methods uh, and specifications. And then coming to construction, we also try to advance sensing uh, so intelligent compaction is one of the themes. Uh, then when the payment is in operation, how do we assess the condition? Uh, then we, can, we are using uh, techniques like GPR, uh, thermal imaging, and so on. Team four looks at the interaction of uh, autonomous vehicles and safety associated with that. Then team uh, three is on rehabilitation, whether we can uh, use uh, recycled materials and more. 
of user friendly or environmental friendly techniques set management uh, team 5 is trying to integrate all these uh, uh, other activities uh, into one uh, regime where uh, even dynamic traffic modeling can be combined to assess the payment damage and overall we are also trying to look at digital twin concept for transport infrastructure so with that uh, i will move on to the webinar today and uh, you can ask questions uh, by clicking on the question and answers here and also uh, record the slide number uh, when you ask your questions so this is a, a broadly broad classification of payment types so flexible payments which will be the focus today and even next week uh, uh, part 2 will be on flexible payments and also we will be concentrating mostly on unbound payments which has a thin seal and base sub base and sub grade around 90% 90% of australian payments fall into this category then of course you can have semi bound payments with cement treated materials and then bound payments which are concretes which are classified as a rigid payments then also we can have composite payments uh, with asphalt overlay and concrete slabs and so on so our presentation will look at some basic concepts as well because some practitioners may have forgotten uh, uh, various uh, basic geotechnical engineering concepts so we will uh, cater for them as well so others who are well familiar with these things please bear with me so here we look at the granular materials and soils in general as three phase material uh, we have solid material and water and air so when air is present uh, is unsaturated material if air is not present the voids void volume is fully utilized by water then we have the saturated material so here we have general uh, condition uh, and we can define all these uh, parameters uh, void ratio is commonly known volume of void divided by volume of solids uh, and degree of saturation uh, is the volume of voids divided by volume of water divided by volume of voids that means in void volume how much is occupied by water so if you have a saturated soil degree of saturation would be 1 and degree of saturation is normally referred to as dos in payment engineering so i'll be using that term quite heavily then gravimetric water content is the water content in mass basis which we obtain from oven drying volumetric water content is the water content in volume basis uh, and this is normally obtained when you use non destructive techniques such as nucleo uh, density meter density gauge or uh, tdr probes and so on they only sample a certain volume of soil therefore the moisture content we get is volumetric water content so that needs to be uh, kept in mind here are some more basic parameters and their relationships and specific gravity is the relative density of minerals uh, solids uh, in the soil or granular material and specific gravity uh, some typical numbers are given on the right and you can see they range from 2.6 to 2.9 and so on for rocks and sands and silt and clay they vary like that a typical number we assume around 2.7 uh, when other information is not available so these are the relationships dry density and bulk density and uh, uh, degree of saturation as i mentioned uh, is referred to as dos and sr is a more technical way of writing it can be given in this uh, two equations if you use gravimetric uh, water density is 1, uh, rho d is the dry density of soil, specific gravity. So in order to calculate DOS, 
you need gravimetric water content or volumetric and the density of uh, dry density and the specific gravity. So if specific gravity is not available, you can assume a typical value. Degree of saturation should come out less than one. It cannot be more than one. Therefore, if you end up with the value more than one, maybe your assumption for the specific gravity may not be correct. So you can take it back, uh, adjust it until you get one when you know soil is saturated. So these are the typical payment materials uh, uh, requirements uh, when you consider good material and the material uh, should be able to be compacted, placed compacted and should be economical. Uh, that is why the uh, granular materials are popular. Then strength and stiffness uh, should be there to minimize damage and deformation under load. Durability it should not deteriorate with time, like disintegration of particles or erosion and things like that. Volume stability, uh, it should not change volume with time, such as shrinking, swelling, cracking, and so on. Then water resistance, erosion, strength, stiffness reduction with water sensitivity. We call it water sensitive materials because parameters like stiffness and strength vary with water content. Then the permeability should be uh, low uh, or high depending on the application. So some of these tech, uh, parameters we will be looking at how to characterize them. Unbound granular materials or UGMs. So I might use, be using the term UGM. Uh, and uh, we have two materials listed here. Uh, crushed rock is more like a good quality materials. Basalt, granite are two examples as you can see here. Uh, so there are various classes depending on gradation, particle disintegration, and so on. Los Angeles value may be used to detect the particle disintegration. Then marginal materials are materials of lower quality geologic materials such as scoria, as you can see here. Uh, vesicles are there during formation, sandstone, gravels, and sands. Behavioral characteristics of UGMs. So UGMs develop uh, strength, shear strength through interparticle friction. So when two particles uh, move relative to each other, uh, frictional resistance is, has to be overcome. So main strength come from that. Then we can also get interparticle interlock. Uh, when soil is compacted, we create a denser mass so when they are trying, when we try to shear them or relative movement, we'll have to overcome this interlock as you can see in this example. In addition, we also can have limited cohesion due to soil suction. So soil suction is the menisci forces uh, which develop between particles uh, due to capillarity of water. So this, these are like links which is formed between the particles and that suction can add to the strength and lead to some apparent cohesion. Primary distress modes of UGMs. So usually uh, unbound granular materials deform through shear and densification due to traffic load, so more commonly known as rutting. As you can see in this picture here, uh, rutting is the depression you get in the wheel path of the uh, traffic. So uh, that's due to either uh, densification of the material underneath or uh, shear. So you can see in this picture here, um, uh, we have a granular layer, which is the UGM and below subgrade. Of course, you can have uh, different layers in the granular medium uh, base and sub base in some instances. So each case, the rutting uh, or deformation can come from both these layers. So both granular and subgrade can contribute to rutting. What percentage 
each one uh, contribute to rutting may depend. Sometimes 60% uh, can come from subgrade, 40% from granular or other way around, depending on the uh, construction and uh, design. Subgrade materials are predominantly soils, clay soils and sandy soils, as you can see here. So that's the natural material over which the pavement is constructed, uh, of course, prepared prior to pavement construction. So uh, subgrade materials also particulate materials, although they are clay predominantly, still particulate materials. So they develop strength to interparticle friction or shear. Uh, cohesion uh, can also arise due to soil suction and over consolidation. Uh, when soil is heavily compacted, uh, you can get uh, soil cohesion or it is over consolidated by geology, color origin, then still you can get cohesion. So again, primary distress modes for subgrades is very similar uh, to the UGMs. Um, rotting is the key deformation uh, mechanism and you can get both granular and subgrade uh, contributing to rutting. In addition, clay soils can undergo deformation due to environmental effects such as wet dry cycles. And this can lead to undulations uh, in road pavements, uh, as you can see in this picture. Basic material characterization uh, may include these four uh, things, particle size distribution, Atterberg's limits, unified soil classification system, uh, compaction of geomaterials. So I'll be touching on this uh, very briefly. So particle size distribution is a very important aspect uh, in uh, granular materials as well as soils. Uh, so as you can see in this picture here, uh, we have the particle size distribution chart, percentage passing on the y-axis, a particle size on the x-axis and when you get a gradation curve if it is uh, fairly sharp dropping then we call it uniformly graded because particles are pretty much on the same particle size. If it is uh, varying in this fashion in a mild manner then it could be well graded because many particles are there in equal proportions more or less so which is easier to and higher density can be obtained with well graded materials. And there are various uh, coefficients which characterize the particle size distribution shape, uh, coefficient of uniformity and coefficient of curvature. So these are some examples of uh, uh, granular material gradations and this is obtained from Wickrode's specification. Um, and uh, um, you can see here some classes of um, um, crushed rock is uh, granular material is given here. Uh, classes, are, there are four classes in general in that guide. Uh, class one is a premium cohesive payment base, the top quality material, and there may be a minimum particle uh, power class index and the maximum permeability limit with them. Uh, class two, high quality placement material, recycled material, materials are also permitted in this. And class three is a high quality upper sub base uh, for heavy duty payments and uh, other criteria may also come in and they can be used as base for lightly traffic payments. This is uh, lower sub base material. And if you need to know more details, you need to go to the original document. But I want to show here the, the gradation curves. Uh, so red and green uh, signify uh, this region, uh, which is the region for class one and two, right? So that's the best uh, region according to this guide. Many other uh, road authorities have uh, their own guidelines and generally fall uh, close to these guidelines. 
So there are some uh, variations to these in natural uh, uh, UGMs, especially marginal materials. And you can see here, apart from the uh, uniform and uh, well graded, you also have what is known as gap graded. So there is a more or less a gap in the particles in the middle region. Uh, so there, there are no particles in this region. So that uh, can be a problem in some cases. So need to be specially treated. And sometimes this is known as armchair grading because it looks like an armchair. And we have plotted the same uh, uh, gradation curve from Big Roads here. And I have plotted another gradation curve uh, from New Zealand, uh, a material which has been tested uh, and failed in accelerated loading facility there. So you can see it falls outside uh, this uh, accepted gradation for weak roads and this material has failed uh, lots of rotting in uh, less number of traffics. So we can see the armchair effect is also there uh, outside this and that can have an uh, undesirable effect. In addition, uh, particle shapes are also in, important. Uh, so there are four particle shapes listed here, angular, and this is the best kind for interlock and compaction, then rounded, a uh, bit difficult to compact, and achieve high densities. Elongated and flaky can disintegrate uh, with loading uh, because of the elongated nature. Then for soils, uh, Atterberg limits have been proposed in 1911 by Atterberg and commonly used. So we have these three quantities. Uh, liquid limit uh, is the uh, lowest water content at which soil exhibits viscous behavior or we should say highest water content that soil can be useful with some strength. Uh, plastic limit is the lowest water content uh, where soil can exhibit plasticity. After that, soil becomes very brittle and cracking and so on. So between these two limits, LL is the highest water content, PL is the lowest, you get the plasticity index. The higher this PI, uh, that means there is a lot of water which can be held uh, in the soil, which can be a reflection of the soil is very reactive. So uh, this is called plasticity chart. So the liquid limit on the x-axis, plasticity index on the y-axis. And if you plot your value, and for example, if you end up here, uh, that is known as case of high plasticity and classification is CH. And in contrast, if you value plotted here, your uh, clay will be classified as clays of low plasticity and other soils are silks and so on will fall below this A line. This is the unified soil classification chart. So commonly uh, referred in test books and so on. So broadly it is classified coarse grained and fine grained. Coarse grains are gravels and sands and other UGMs will be classified here. Uh, unify, uh, the, uh, the coefficient of uniformity and curvature are used in classification. Soils are classified based on the plasticity chart to uh, a various clays of plasticity. So with that, uh, I move on to the uh, compaction of geomaterials. And uh, usually uh, we call compaction when we input mechanical energy uh, and densify the soil primarily by reducing air voids or we remove the air voids from soil to densify the soil. So what is the difference with soil consolidation? Consolidation term is used in soil mechanics to refer to saturated soils, when we remove water and get the particles together and densify them, uh, and that's known as consolidation. So it's associated with the saturated soils. Proctor curve was developed in 1933 by Proctor, 
uh, to characterize the uh, soils and granular materials. And uh, a typical characteristic of Proctor curve is the inverted shape, parabolic shape. When you plot water content on the x-axis and dry density on the y-axis. So standard Proctor is, as you can see here in this picture, uh, you have a standard mold and a standard hammer and number of blows per layer is uh, designated. Therefore, energy input into the soil is designated. And when you do the compaction for the soil at different moisture contents, you get this uh, inverted parabolic shape. And the peak of this curve gives the maximum dry density you can achieve for this level of energy input. And the corresponding moisture content is known as the optimum moisture content. However, if you perform the test with higher energy level using a bigger hammer, and then you might end up with this kind of a curve which is moved up. And that's for the modified Proctor energy level. But interesting thing is, uh, when we join these peak points, they fall in uh, one line and that's known as the line of optimums, or I might call it loop. Uh, and uh, this loop basically have a certain degree of saturation. So you can see the degree of saturation lines can be drawn. This is the 100% saturation, the 80% the saturation, the 60%. So line of optimums also will have a certain degree of saturation. So that's the important thing to remember. And compaction in the field, of course, will be carried out by rollers and the energy level input is not very clear uh, uh, in that. But densities can be measured using uh, nuclear densometers and so on. These are typical compaction curves for different soils. Uh, you can see eight compaction curves are shown here qualitatively uh, mainly. And you can see when you go to sands, uh, well-graded sands, you get the higher and of all UGMs will also be in this, this region. You can go to 2.2, 2.3, even densities with UGMs. And when you add more clay and so on, you go down here. Uh, and if you have very poorly graded sand, that can also fall well below, difficult to compact. Uh, so that's what you can see from these compaction curves. So another feature of compaction curve is you can draw a family. We mentioned already Proctor, modified Proctor, uh, reduced Proctor. You can reduce it uh, to handheld compaction and so on. And if you want to uh, simulate much higher compaction, you can go higher. So you can create a family of compaction. And uh, always when you draw the compaction curve, you need to draw the degree of saturation 100 line or degree of saturation is 1, 100%. Then also draw the line of optimums, uh, which is normally constant, 80 to 90%. So then uh, very important things to uh, uh, understand from this curve, uh, when you're on the dry side of this optimums line or line of optimums loop, basically your air is free to move. So when you load the soil, air can escape. Therefore, uh, it is uh, uh, water pressures don't develop and suction is higher here, strength can be higher. When you go to wet side of optimum, your air phase is trapped and between the water and therefore when you load the soil your water pressure and the air pressure both build up and that's the very reason that you cannot compact the soil very well in this region your limb uh, your compaction curve drops down the harder you try to compact still you get lower density the reason is air pressure and water pressure build up when you try to compact the soil and same thing happens when you try to load the soil with traffic. So you don't want to go beyond this red line. So DOS, 
at the optimum must not be uh, exceeded. So that's important in construction and you need to examine the climatic conditions whether that will happen. So other thing is in this region, you can see uh, the soil will have a bit of open structure, air can move. And then at this point, you get more trapping of the air. And on the right hand side, you get uh, intact soil where uh, permeability is very low and air is trapped uh, with water. So these are some compaction curve examples uh, from another study uh, we have done. And uh, you can see the clay soils here, uh, blue and red uh, is some silty soils and sands, uh, which are pure sands in, in green. One few things to observe, uh, this uh, shape of this limb on the lower limb, if it is sharp, it can indicate water sensitivity. That if you wet the soil from this state, it can undergo densification by compression. So sharper the curve, that can be a problem. Uh, and uh, clay sand here, which doesn't have much fines, so flatter curve, more or less, right? And uh, other thing is clay here uh, has lower density and uh, not as sharp curve. Degree of saturation, line of optimums, SRL or DOS here, this one is 80%, so it's typical for clay. Silt, 70%. Sand, this is pure sand, 50%. So UGMs generally approach about 80 to 90% mark as well, just like clays. This is X-ray tomography picture we have developed to illustrate that how air and water get trapped at the optimum level. So, so gray is solid, blue is water, AI is uh, gray or white, right? So you can see they are trapped and when you load it, AI and water pressure both develop. Another emergent patterns from the compaction curve. So I'm here drawing uh, with degree of saturation, the density and other parameters, but you can also draw them with water content. Same thing we'll get, you will get. So density with DOS, you get a compaction curve. You can also draw with water as you do traditionally. Then if you do permeability, with, then permeability be minimum to the weight of optimum, right? That's why clay liners are compacted weight of optimum to get minimum permeability to prevent leachate and other nasty liquids going into ground. However, modulus and tensile strength, modulus uh, is peaked uh, dry of optimum. So dry of optimum, you get the peak modulus and then it drops down again. So modulus has a different shape. And this is the water retention curve. And I will talk about this more later. And inflection point matches with this point. And we also have found when you bury a metal in soil, like pipes and so on, they corrode most at the optimum. So ironically, we are compacting soils to the maximum density. And at the same time, we are providing the highest corrosion potential for metal objects we bury in the ground, like such as pipes. So which has been revealed by one of our PhD students, uh, Rukshan Asua. So other features of compaction curve. So here you can see uh, gap graded geomaterials and it's a prior stream gravel uh, source from New South Wales by one of our PhD students. And you can see here, it's an armchair kind of grab graded uh, uh, gradation. Sorry, this one. Uh, this is the uh, gradation blue one here. Other one is a, a different uh, gradation curve. So you can see for the uh, Kurangamite gravel, uh, you can see uh, the compaction curve is very funny. Uh, when it's a peak, then it drops down dramatically. And that's an indication it is very water sensitive uh, because the particles are uh, at the contact points of the aggregates and they are wetted. You can get uh, quite significant rearrangement of particles 
which can lead to rotting and so on. So it's indicative here, but still the peak value is 80% degree of saturation. So how do you specify a compaction to the field? So current specification may consider soil preparation, minimum density, and it may be relative to the modified Proctor value, 100% of the modified Proctor value or 95% or 98%. Then moisture range, also relative to the optimum moisture contents. Sometimes relative moisture content is used dividing by OMC, uh, 100%, 80%, 70%, and so on. DOS limits, degree of saturation, and uh, some uh, a road authority such as Queensland has this kind of requirement where uh, if soils are compacted at optimum, they need to be dried back to DOS less than 70% prior to sealing and so on, trafficking. That's to allow uh, that you are away from that red line, uh, optimum line, line of optimums, LU, uh, and uh, therefore it behaves better without any pore pressure development layer thickness range, roller types, etc. So hydraulic characterization. Uh, three things I am hoping to discuss. Water retention curve, soil water retention curve, saturated permeability, Ksat, unsaturated permeability, K unsat. So some of you may not be familiar with uh, this terminology. Uh, when we mention permeability, we might say just permeability. In such cases, we may be referring to the saturated permeability. But unsaturated permeability is when the soil is in unsaturated state. Uh, that's different. So as you can see, a compaction curve has a lot of hidden information embedded in them. We are only using small amount of it. So uh, we have developed a frame, framework known as MPK framework to explain uh, the compaction curve in general, utilizing the compaction stress as well in a uh, family of compaction curves and associated other features. And it can be used to predict uh, the settlements uh, and collapse uh, waiting uh, shrinking, swelling, and so on uh, for uh, compacted soils. And it's published in this journal paper. Uh, you can download it uh, freely uh, from internet. Then we recently developed a more uh, advanced model for finite element uh, um, implementation based on the MPK framework known as MPK model. Uh, I don't have time to go through them. And that's also based on the compaction curve as the backbone uh, curve uh, in these uh, constitutive models. And paper is uh, given there. So hydraulic characterization, uh, because water is the primary factor which can um, affect the performance of uh, granular and subgrade materials, it's important to understand how it affects and two uh, parameters are the water retention curve and the permeability. So uh, we can categorize the uh, water flow of uh, soils in this fashion. So for example, if degree of saturation is one, saturated soils, so AI, and AI is not present uh, only maybe dissolved state and water pressure can build up quickly with loading especially undrained loading. So that's why we want to avoid uh, payments going to degree of saturation to one or generally above uh, the line of optimum's value, SRL. Because above DOS SRL, you get discontinuous air phase, discontinuous water phase and air pressure and water pressure can build up. And if uh, DOS is less than SRL, air phase is continuous, therefore, uh, air can escape and therefore water pressure doesn't build up as much. So that's a better performance. Dry soils, of course, don't only have air. 
So uh, when we talk about water flow, uh, there are two aspects to consider. One is uh, retention of water, other one is flow. Uh, retention of water is storage, which is characterized by water retention curve. And it's a relationship between water content and DOS or suction. Water flow is the rate, so that's characterized by permeability. So this is a typical water retention curve. Uh, you can see uh, on the x-axis what you call suction. It's like pulling water out. When you are drying a saturated soil, this suction will increase this way. This is like bone dry, oven dry condition, right? Um, and uh, uh, if you leave a soil in the atmosphere, uh, you might be reaching around here. For, for so many hours on the bench, you may be reaching around here. Oven dry is here. Saturated is here. So when it's saturated, this axis gives you the volumetric water content. Typically volumetric is given, but other water contents can be plotted. Uh, this is for the clay soils and water content is higher. Uh, silty may be lower and sandy may be even lower. So one thing you can see in this fine grain soil, part pore sizes are small, particle sizes are also small. They can retain water saturated for a long time uh, high suctions and then air entry happens uh, air entry happens at these points so that those are the air entry points and this is the point where optimum water content is a uh, point of inflection so uh, if you compare soil to this optimum water content then your suction may be around here and if you dry back uh, to a a smaller uh, degree of saturation. This may be 80%, 90%, 70% you dry back, then your suction will increase to a higher value. Therefore, it is a more competent, stiffer material uh, and, uh, and air phase is um, continuous and air can escape. And that's why dry back is a good option when soil is compacted at optimum. Compacting at optimum gives you minimum energy for the rollers to compare, right? But it's not the optimum for performance. Then uh, this is from the uh, MPDGE guide also, but Zapata uh, is uh, the reference. Uh, so uh, US design guide has this kind of curves. So they are plotting degree of saturation or DOS against matrix suction. These are for sandy soils so or UGMs and they are characterized by uh, D60, 60% 60 passing diameter, and particle sizes changing. And when particle size become very small, clay-like, they are using this WPI. W is the percentage fines less than 400 microns times the PI. PI is the part plus the index. So together, this number is calculated. When number is increasing, you get more clay-like behavior, right? So gradation curve, not gradation curve, SWCC becomes, uh, SWRC becomes uh, pretty flatter. Unsaturated hydraulic conductivity or permeability uh, has a similar characteristic. So here on the top, we see the water content matrix suction. Clay soils have the, these the SWRC, air entry here. And when you go to the blue curve, coefficient of permeability curve, uh, it also has a saturated value up to that point, then the permeability drops, right? So it corresponds, AI entry up to AI entry, saturated permeability value will be the same for up to this suction, 100 kPa in this instance. So up to 100 kPa suction or drying, your saturated permeability will applicable. But beyond that, AI is entered and water is, finds it hard to pass because AI is there and therefore permeability will drop. So this is known as the permeability function, which you have to include in various seepage programs like CW, for example. So typical specifications for saturated permeability of UGMs 
so base permeability we want to uh, uh, limit them uh, so that water will not pass and accumulate uh, so permeability in the range of 0.03 meters per day or 0.4 meter day uh, may be common and this means roughly it would take about 33 days for this one uh, or 2.5 days for this one for water to go one meter for example if the payment is flooded with uh, water on top of it uh, for water to come from laterally if the seal is uh, fairly competent uh, water to come from lateral sides it might take this kind of time so permeability uh, is low but permeability in uh, UGMs can go very high also, 1000 meters per day, and they may be used for more open grade bases uh, with permeable bases uh, for specific designs. Uh, so water to pass through and then collect it and removed. Sub base usually should have at least 10 times more permeable than the base so that any uh, water uh, which comes from base can be quickly transferred uh, through the down um, um, and uh, outwards from the cross fall. Characterization of shear strength is the next component. So we are trying to look at three parts. So triaxial test is commonly used for characterization of shear strength of granular or subgrade materials. And uh, triaxial state is basically cylindrical sample all around stress from water pressure uh, uh, is given by sigma three. And the vertical stress is given by sigma one. So uh, if sigma three is all around the same, uh, then you get what's called as the confining stress. So that means uh, this soil is confined by this stress and that has a desirable thing because it increased the density. So compaction is actually like this in one dimension in the compaction mold. Here it's in three dimension isotropically uh, used. Uh, but in triaxial also volumetric uh, compaction happens here. But when you have the deviatoric stress, sigma one minus sigma three, then uh, you get shear. Uh, you get a shear happening and that can lead to deformation as well and shear failure, right? total failure of the specimen. So shear strength is normally given by Mohr Coulomb uh, relationship uh, and that equation is given here. So shear strength on the y-axis uh, is given by a frictional component uh, tan phi is the coefficient of friction, if you like, of the particles, multiplied by the applied stress on it, plus the any cohesion it may have. So this curve here uh, is uh, a straight line in this representation. C is the intercept, phi is the friction angle. So when you go to unsaturated materials, because uh, DOS will be not one, those can be less than one. Uh, desirably, we should have less than the optimum DOS or the line of optimum one, 70% uh, uh, desirable. In that case, uh, you have a cohesion uh, coming from the suction. Uh, re remember the water retention curve ha can have higher suctions when degree of saturation drops or water content drops. And that can be written like this. S is the suction which is stress, tan phi B is the kind of a friction angle associated with suction. So this thing here add to the cohesion which may come from interlock uh, of the particles. So together uh, it will add to the co apparent cohesion. So in other words, if you have a DOS equal one or saturated material, when you have unsaturated material, this curve will move upwards depending on the suction and that's a desirable thing because when we load the payment with, we are coming from this region and up with the traffic loads, but if this curve is further up, we are not going to get shear failure or the effects of it. 
typical C5 parameters for UGMs. So you can see here um, the curve normally has a peak and uh, 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 and a strain softening part or reduction. That's typical for over consolidated or compacted materials. And phi value uh, obtained from this kind of curves from the triaxial test can vary from 45 to 60 uh, at the peak stress. Uh, some weaker materials may have lower values. Cohesion, which is very important as well, uh, can be 50, 100, some instances. So higher cohesion uh, then can mean a lot of uh, resistance. For subgrade, uh, it is a clay-like material mostly. Uh, therefore, we will be using undrained shear strength uh, mainly, but uh, it might be characterized by other field characterization methods, uh, such as DP uh, dynamic cone, penetrometer, and so on. Some typical values are given here. Next one is deformation characterization. Uh, so we are looking at only laboratory ones, field ones we'll look at next uh, week, or not week, next webinar. Uh, California bearing ratio and resilient modulus. So California bearing ratio, everybody knows, uh, was developed in California uh, and uh, it has this mold and the soil is compacted in layers and there's a plunger uh, which is uh, deformed down and applying force and you measure the force and the displacement and there's some annular rings of uh, material to prevent soil failing at the uh, providing some uh, surcharge. So the results come out with the load and displacement of penetration. So these are two typical curves, curve one, curve two and three if you like. So we measure the force corresponding to 2.5 millimeter and force corresponding to 5 millimeter. Then we compare those forces with some standard for forces uh, for, the, for a reference material. So if one divided by 13.2 and that ratio is percentage given as a um, uh, percentage, then F2 is 19.8 is the reference load and from these two percentages, the greater is reported as the CBR. So there is always question whether CBR is a strength parameter or a stiffness parameter. But in my opinion, it's a relative stiffness. Let's see why. Uh, I can write the numerator of the CBR, top part, upstairs, uh, force uh, measured, for a certain displacement 2.505, right? So I call it delta, F divided by delta, so that's a stiffness. Denominator or the downstairs uh, of the CBR is the reference force for the same displacement, either 2.5 or 5. Now let's get the ratio, F over delta. This gets others uh, upside down, delta or F. Delta cancel of F divided by F ref. So this is the definition of the CBR. So CBR is a relative stiffness in that case. So typical values of CBR are given here uh, for different kinds of clay and then going to sand. Uh, you can see the values here. Uh, uh, these are the classifications we talked about. Soil classifications, CH for soils of high plasticity. So lowest uh, CBRs come in. And uh, if the drainage is uh, poor, then uh, you can get smaller values. So typically characterized by soaked CBR, soaked for a period of time, it can go even one and so on. So you can see the, uh, uh, if you have drainage uh, higher or soil is not going to get wet, then higher CBR values can be obtained. So remember CBR uh, value in the subgrade is a very important parameter in the payment design and that can lead to a, uh, significant cost savings if you can rely on a higher value uh, by having proper drainage or having confidence that that particular payment is not going to uh, uh, go to uh, poor drainage conditions due to lack of rain 
or proper drainage, or and so on. So it is an important thing to remember uh, in terms of payment design and cost savings. So here an example of CBR with moisture content. Uh, so uh, you can have see the dash line here is for uh, as molded CPR for certain moisture content. If you um, mold the soil here and compact to a certain proctor level, and that's the kind of CPR you get. It gets higher and then comes down again later, but that's the curve. But if you wet it, soak, then a CPR drops in this fashion. The further away from uh, the line of optimums, Lou, then the, the larger the drop or water sensitivity can become higher when you go further away, right? That can be a problem if the payment is likely to be submerged later. If you compact the soil well away from the optimum, you, it may undergo some collapse or some significant settlement uh, due to this kind of condition. But if you, of course, design the payment to soak CBR value, then uh, um, then of course you are having a very uh, robust payment as well. So economy is uh, not, uh, maybe not so good. So resilient modulus uh, is a more advanced way of finding the stiffness. So you can use the triaxial device, but you can uh, do the repeated load triaxial by repeating the triaxial test and then uh, you get uh, uh, this kind of uh, repeated loaded uh, um, uh, patterns, getting the stress by repeating it uh, uh, using a certain uh, load level and cycling it. And you can see here during cycles, permanent deformation develops. And then after a while, good material should uh, behave in the resilient manner without developing further deformation. And the gradient at that level is the resilient modulus. Now, another thing to observe is resilient modulus or the modulus in general for granular materials is a function of the confining pressure. So if you don't have any confining pressure, like uh, when you walk on the sand, uh, if it is uh, uh, surface, there'll be a lot of deformation. But if you uh, press it down further, it doesn't deform anymore because you are confining the soil. So same thing happen on pavements. And uh, if uh, uh, the, near the surface, there is no much confinement, but when the traffic comes, there'll be stresses that will allow confinement to happen significantly. Um, and uh, so confinement uh, has effect on the um, stiffness. So that need to be considered. And this is considered in the Austral Australian payment design guide. There's a technique called sublayering in Circle, if you like. Uh, and that takes into account this uh, increasing effect of confining pressure on the modulus. So typical modulus values uh, for our UGMs are given here. Uh, this is from the Ostrode uh, Guide to Payment Technology. So um, um, high uh, standard crushed rocks and normal standard crushed rocks and base uh, quality gravel and uh, sub-base materials, so uh, value drops here. There are other parameters associated with it for the design, like, uh, uh, like the uh, poisons ratio and degree of anisotrop. So another important thing to remember is uh, depending on the stress level uh, of the material, uh, unborn materials, uh, you are um, rutting a vertical strain here with number of cycles. So that means uh, rutting on the y-axis and the number of cycles on x-axis uh, can vary. The, the sort of uh, behavior can vary. Here's an example here where loading is done in this path. Uh, A is the uh, kind of loading which comes very close to this failure line. Remember, we discussed the failure line. So it comes very close to it. Then what happens is, Sorry, this has been drawn a little bit incorrectly. Uh, A should be here at C. Uh, C must be here. A should be there, C must be here. So when it is very close, failure can happen very quickly and rutting can progress 
uncontrollably and payment can uh, fail prematurely. And then the B is in between. A is the most desirable, A is here, lowest strength. Uh, so this should be, um, uh, sorry, uh, this should be C. Uh, and uh, that actually shows the smallest amount of vertical strain or rotting and shakes down. So that's what's called shaken down state. So that's the kind of thing we like to see in the payment and it will not deteriorate as much. Uh, slow accumulation of damage over a long period of time, therefore payment can last a longer time. But we want to avoid coming close to the uh, this failure line, having this kind of premature deterioration. But remember this line, this red line, also moves up and down uh, with the amount of water. So if we have uh, wetting, then this will come down uh, to saturated kind of state, which can cause a good payment to fail early because of the uh, oil stressing. So this is some specification of UGMs, uh, again taken from weak roads. Now this specifies the, all the things we mentioned, liquid limit plus index, California bearing ratio, uh, and this parameter takes into account the PI together. And uh, so classes one to three, we mentioned before, their uh, characteristics are given here. There are some, here are some take home messages uh, uh, from our webinar today. Uh, shape of the compaction curve. It's more than meet the eye. Uh, there are more things to learn from the compaction curve and there are hidden information. Uh, for example, a sharp limb on the dry side of optimum may indicate likely enhanced settlement when wetted and loaded, right? Uh, so also uh, remember the sharp limb when you draw it, uh, you have to draw with respect to clay in the same axis because Y axis density, you can stretch it artificially by uh, taking different scales. Uh, so if you want to see the true nature of that uh, limb, you need to draw it with clay as well uh, so that you can see the difference. DOS can be given with MC, moisture content, and dry density to better characterize soil condition. So in Queensland, for example, DOS is commonly used and, uh, and in other places, DOS may not be used, but DOS is a very important character, uh, characteristics uh, to be used. So if you have these two things measured, you can calculate DOS easily. You need these two parameters and specific gravity you need many to assume, so you can do that. DOS at optimum at an SRL is common for both soil, uh, for a soil in both laboratory and field. So that we so that uh, when uh, when we calculate the DOS at optimum or SRL 80%, 90%, that's common even in the field. So in the field, we don't know the compaction level, but DOS will be the same. So we need to be away from that. So if in the field, if you measure MC and dry density, you can calculate DOS and that DOS can be compared with the SRL obtained in the lab, uh, which are pretty uh, good values. So this feature can be useful in specifying DOS, such as DOS less than 70%. DOS greater than or uh, more for the line of optimum SRL can produce premature payment failures due to traffic loading. KSAT, KANSAT have different permeability values and we mentioned usually KSAT is much bigger. So these are the references uh, uh, for this uh, uh, webinar, we have used them in various places, so you can download them when possible. I also like to pay thanks to those who helped me um, develop this webinar. Uh, includes uh, uh, Dr. Aruran, uh, uh, Samir, uh, and also Troy. Uh, thank you very much for your contributions. So that basically brings us to the end of the seminar. So next webinar will be field characterization, flexible uh, UGM payment design and climatic effects. So that will be uh, our next one. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm happy to answer your questions.
அருண் Do you have any questions? Arun, are you there? Okay, there's one question I can see. Uh, is it possible to experiment drainage conditions during CBR testing rather than soaking? So that's an interesting question. Uh, so generally, uh, we soak uh, it for 24 hours or so various times. uh five day and things like that so normally that kind of soaking uh does not uniformly uh wet the soil because water has to come from one end and maybe the edges and so on uh however due to the time limitations and the cbr is a relatively index kind of test uh people are resorting to simpler approaches yes it can be controlled uh, under uh, hello technical issue with the uh, audio so can you hear me now yes sir and i am going through the uh, questions myself at the moment yeah. so it, it's okay all right so a couple of questions agenda you already answered or? no i am going through them next question oh. is from jian fen yes uh, cbr is often related to soil types but i have seen very high cbr values greater than 60 in uh, geotechnical report of a site in adelaide the site is clay sand material water table is about 4 meters below the surface it is because unsaturated condition or completely wrong value um yes i think uh, uh, greater than 60 can be uh, uh, quite high Uh, for a, a sandy material or clay sand or whatever even a clay sand uh, maybe it was heavily compacted i'm not sure uh, it looks like a higher value uh, and uh, of course if there is sufficient clay it can get significant suction uh, then that can if it is soil is in dry state then not in saturated state then you might get that kind of number Uh, remember it is a modulus value so numbers can go pretty high rapidly in modulus uh, so uh, of course the higher values are normally observed for uh, uh, crush rocks and so on uh, which can be more than 100 even next question is what would be the modulus for circle for class 2 crush rock in flexible pavements uh, that's a very specific question so uh, uh, i think uh, i'm not very sure um but um, uh usually uh it is best is to um uh test them in the lab and obtain the resilient modulus values um for uh, unknown uh, materials so when you i have doubt uh, rather than using presumptive values so otherwise you may need to assign a certain presumptive value based on the uh, chart given in uh, ostrod's guide uh but then you may rely on the experience so these are the three questions uh, written yes uh, janda so in that case uh, i think we have come to an oh, there is another question just came in great webinar thank you <laughs> it's interesting to know that uh, from a recent research that metal mains are more likely to corrode that omc uh just a minute uh um uh, interesting to know your comments on compaction in road constru- reconstruction projects um i'm not sure whether it is related to the uh interested to know your comments on compaction in road uh, reconstruction projects um whether that's also related to the uh metal no probably not so yes metal uh, that's a very recent finding from one of our phd students uh, dr rukshan azwa uh, he found uh, uh, that um, uh, geotechnical engineers try to compare it to omc but uh, uh, 
uh, materials engineers uh, worried about corrosion, but we did both together and we found that that's the point where the corrosion potential is maximum. And the reason is uh, for corrosion, you need uh, water and oxygen both. And as I mentioned in the line of optimums, uh, degree of saturation uh, is such that uh, air and water are both present in optimum quantities. When you go to higher degree of saturation, air get trapped and difficult to get air. When you go to dry side, difficult to get water. So therefore that optimum position uh, is where corrosion is maximum. In relation to uh, comments on compaction in roads, uh, I'm not very sure, but I know uh, DOS is not calculated very much in, uh, when you go to a site investigation in the field, uh, we get uh, water content, but we don't get the density to calculate DOS. I think DOS is the one which dictates uh, whether the payment is failing or not, because moisture content can vary, optimum value can vary depending on the density or the compaction level. Modified Procter will have a different optimum moisture content. Normal Procter has another one. Uh, in the field, you have another one. Therefore, uh, you need to, DOS uh, takes into account that in a more um, a general way. So uh, it's good to do that. Uh, Queensland main roads is uh, heavily uh, using DOS and specifying that in the field. And intelligent compaction is something we will touch on next week uh, in terms of compaction. So uh, that a high value of CBR should be called in situ CBR value. Um, uh, yes, high value of CBR, of course, if soil is in a, in a unsaturated state, your CBR would be much higher or modulus in general would be much higher. But if you wet it, then CBR can come down. Just like the modulus can. So I think it looks like we have uh, I, uh, completed most of the questions. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so I think we will conclude the 